บางเงียบหลังท่านเต้นเกยลำแถวเตียงจวง Sounds True presents the art of mindful living with Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich Nhat Hanh is a meditation master, a scholar, a poet, a social activist, and the author of over 70 books, including *The Miracle of Mindfulness* and *Peace Is Every Step*. The art of mindful living was recorded during one of Thich Nhat Hanh's visits to North America. This live recording. Is composed of highlights from a five-day retreat led by Thich Nhat Hanh in a monastery in Mundelein, Illinois. During the retreat, one hears the sound of a bell. This is the bell of mindfulness, and serves as a reminder to participants to remember their true nature and return to their breathing. And now, the art of mindful living with Thich Nhat Hanh. Tonight, I will give instructions on breathing. It's so important. If you don't know how to practice breathing, then it will be difficult to follow the retreat. The first exercise is in out. It means breathing in. I know that I'm breathing in. Breathing out. I know that I'm breathing out. This is a very important practice. When you breathe in. You know that uh, this is your in breath, and not your out breath. You identify your in breath as in breath, and when you breathe out, you know that this is your out breath. Only that, but it is a very important practice. This is the first exercise on breathing that the Buddha gives to us. When we practice like that, something wonderful happens. We stop the thinking, and this is a, a miracle already, because in our daily life we think too much, and because we think too much, we are not truly ourselves. Our body may be here, but our mind may be elsewhere, in the past, in the future, and therefore when you. Breathe in and out, and become aware of your in breath and out breath. You stop the thinking, and you begin to be where your body is. Our body and our mind are very often separated from each other. And if we practice breathing in and out with some concentration. We attain what we call um, the oneness of body and mind. Your mind and your body are reunified, and you begin to be there truly yourself. And this is the first fruit of your practice. And it needs you to breathe in and out consciously, being aware of your in breath and your out breath. When you are not there, when you are not really there, you cannot see things very clearly and deeply. You miss everything. Everything seems to you not clear, vague. Suppose mommy is sitting there, but only her physical body is there. Her mind is somewhere else. At that time, if you want to come and And get some attention of your mommy, some affection. Well, you will not be successful because she is not really there. She is not available to you, and that happens very often. And we are there by breathing in and out, breathing in, breathing out, and begin to be alive, to be present. And that is the practice of mindfulness. Mindfulness means to be aware of what is going on. Your child is coming, and she wants 
some attention, some affection. You know that. So you smile to her. You may open your arms and hug her. And the basic condition is that you are there. So breathing in and breathing out is to be really there and to be available. Available to whom? Available to your beloved ones. And also to be ready to encounter life. Because life can be found only in the present moment. Let us think a little bit. The beautiful blue sky. When can you get in touch with the blue sky, the present moment? In order not to miss the blue sky, you have to go back to the present moment because it is in that moment that you can get in touch with the blue sky. The beautiful rivers, the beautiful trees, your mommy, your daddy, they are all in the present moment. And if you go back to the present moment, you encounter them. Everything wonderful, everything refreshing, they are in the present moment. Therefore, running to the future or getting lost in the past, you miss life. And therefore, breathing in and out is to get back to the present moment where you have an appointment with life. What you are looking for, like happiness, peace, joy, they are all in the present moment. Look at the tree. It's a wonderful thing, a tree. A tree is very beautiful. A tree to me is as beautiful as a cathedral, even more beautiful. I look into the tree and I saw the whole cosmos in it. I saw the sunshine in the tree. Can you see the sunshine in the tree? Yeah, because without the sunshine, no tree can grow. I see a cloud in the tree. Can you see? Without a cloud, there can be no rain, no tree. I see the earth in the tree. I see everything in the tree. So the tree is where everything in the cosmos come into. And the cosmos reveal itself to me to a tree. Therefore, a tree to me is a cathedral. And I can take refuge in the tree, and I can get nourished by the tree. The tree belongs to the pure land. And I can get in touch with the tree only if I go back to the present moment, because the tree can only be found in the present moment. And that is why in and out is so important. Suppose I practice like this, breathing in, I am aware of my eyes. Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. This is to go back to the present moment in order to discover things that you tend to forget, like your eyes. My eyes make me happy. My eyes are conditions for my happiness. In order to see the beautiful blue sky, the beautiful earth, the children, the adults, all kinds of forms, all kinds of colors, because I have eyes. So breathing in, in order to go back to the present moment, and to get in touch with my eyes is a basic practice for happiness. And breathing out, I smile to my eyes. I smile to my eyes because I am happy to have eyes. I need only to open my eyes in order to to see the beautiful trees and so on. Let us breathe in and out a few times and become aware of the fact that we have eyes. You might like to touch your eyes if you wish by breathing.
you know something there are people who believe that they can enter the kingdom of god or the pure land after they die i don't agree with them i know that you don't have to die in order to go into the kingdom of god in fact you have to be alive to do so you should be alive and you should take one breath in and out and with one foot you make a step and you enter into the kingdom of God right now. And this is possible with the first exercise, breathing in and breathing out. And therefore, if I become aware by breathing in and out, I only need to make one step in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. With some practice, you develop your concentration and then uh, every time you want to enter the kingdom of heaven you can do that you are welcome the door is wide open but if you live in forgetfulness you cannot do that because forgetfulness is the opposite of mindfulness to live in forgetfulness means to get lost in the past in the future to be possessed by anger, hatred, fear. And therefore, you are not ready to enter into the kingdom of God. In order to get rid of forgetfulness, you practice breathing in and out. And mindfulness becomes the result of your practice. And with mindfulness, you get in touch with everything that is wonderful that is refreshing, that is healing in the present moment. So let us invite one sound of the bell and breathe together three times in order to enjoy ourselves, enjoy the kingdom we find ourselves in this very moment. Now we switch to the second exercise. Flower fresh. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Humans are born as flowers. When I look at a child, I see her, I see him as a flower. Very fresh. Very beautiful. Look, our eyes are like flowers. In the Sutra, the eyes of the Buddha are described as lotus flowers. Our lips can be a beautiful flower, especially when we smile. We know how to smile. And this is a flower that we can offer to anyone at any time. Just breathing in and breathing out and smile. And you have one flower to open. And you know something, your eyes can smile too. So when you look at someone and smile with your eyes, you offer two flowers. And if you smile with your mouth, you offer three flowers. (laughs) And your hands are also like flowers. And with my hands, I can form a flower, a lotus flower. And when I bow to someone, I say something like this, a flower for you, the Buddha to be. And I bow to him or to her. So my hands are flowers capable of making people happy. And when I offer a lotus flower, To that person, I offer another flower with my mouth and two other flowers with my eyes. We are born as flowers, but if we don't know how to take care of our flowers, our flower may be tired, may wilt. When you breathe in deeply, you make every cell in your body smile like a flower. Become fresh again for your sake, 
for your own happiness and for the happiness of those around us. If you are not fresh, if you are grouchy, if you are irritated, and then the people around you cannot be happy, therefore practicing becoming a flower again, practicing breathing in, I see myself as a flower, breathing out, I feel fresh. The Buddha practiced refreshing himself. And therefore, when we look at him, we see him like a flower. He is described as sitting on a flower. It means that anywhere he sits, he sits with peace, happiness, freshness, because he is a flower himself. So when you sit on your cushion, sit in such a way that you become a flower, and suddenly your cushion becomes a lotus flower. And practicing the way of the Buddha, you should sit on a lotus flower and not on burning charcoals. <laughs> if you have too much worries, too much anger in yourself, you cannot sit on a flower. You sit on burning charcoal. You have no peace. As soon as you sit down, you want to run again. And therefore, the lotus is not available. In order for the lotus to be available as a seed to you, practice being a flower. Flower fresh. That is the second exercise. And if you practice like that three or four times, you become fresh and you enjoy that. Now we switch to the third exercise, which is mountain solid. In this position, the half lotus position or the lotus position, you find yourself quite stable, solid. If you feel agitated, not solid, vulnerable, breakable, and then you practice this in order to get solid again. The solidity, the stability of the body will help bring about the stability of the mind. And therefore, sit in a stable position and practice breathing in and out. You become more stable in your mind. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I feel solid. From time to time, a very strong emotion overwhelms us. That emotion can be anger or despair of fear. And when we are overwhelmed by a strong emotion, we feel that we are very vulnerable. We may die. This is uh, too bad. Because we are more than our emotion. We are more solid than we may think. And therefore, practicing being solid like a mountain is very helpful. When you look at a tree, during a storm, you see that the top of the tree is not solid. You can only see the tiny branches and a number of leaves on the top of the tree swaying back and forth. You have the impression that the tree is very vulnerable, very fragile. But if you see the tree is firmly rooted in the ground, the impression that the tree is vulnerable will vanish. You see that the tree is much more solid than it looked at the top. We, the human body, the human person, is like that too. We have emotions on the top, somewhere here, but we have the trunk down here. Our trunk is somewhere on this level a little bit below your navel. And with this sitting position, if you bring your attention down to this level and practice breathing in and out and follow the movement of your abdomen, breathing in, breathing out, I see myself as a mountain, I feel solid. 
And if you practice like this one time, two times, three times, your emotion will not be able to destroy you anymore. You now know that you are more than your emotions. Therefore, this exercise is very important. We should practice it every day so that when we face a strong emotion, we know what to do in order to handle our emotions. Let us practice uh, this exercise for a few times. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I feel solid. Try to sit in a solid way to practice this. You don't have to use all the words. You just retain the word mountain for inhalation and solid for your exhalation. Mountain, solid. And now we practice the next exercise, which is water reflecting. Let us visualize a lake in the highland among mountains. The water is so still that it reflects truly the blue sky and the mountains. And if you look into the water, you see your face not distorted at all, because the water is calm, is still. If you take a picture of the lake, when you see that the mountain and the sky reflected in it are just the mountain and the sky above. So when you practice uh, breathing in, you say, Breathing in, I see myself as still water. Means uh, you calm yourself by the breathing. Your breathing can become a wonderful instrument in order to calm yourself. And when you breathe out, you see that in that state of calm and stillness, you reflect things as they are. You do not distort things anymore. When we are not calm, we distort things. We cannot receive the message of other people. You cannot receive the truth from other beings. Suppose the moon, the beautiful moon in the sky, wants to reflect herself in the water of your pond, but the water of your pond is not calm. How can the full moon reflect herself in you? And therefore, it's not the fault of the, the moon, it's the fault of the water. If the pun of the mind of living beings is stilled, the beautiful moon will reflect itself in it. That is an old poem that uh, I read when I was young. If you are still, then your perceptions will be correct. And we will understand what people are trying to tell us. The moon, the mountain, the rivers, the trees, everything is trying to tell us the truth. But because the water of our mind is not still, that is why we are not able to receive the truth from the cosmos. And therefore, we should practice breathing in and out and calm ourselves for true understanding to be possible. Sitting quietly and breathing in and out is a wonderful way to calm yourself and to be still waters. Then the next exercise is space free. Breathing in, I see myself as space. And breathing out, I feel free. Space is the symbol of liberty. If you do not have space around you, you cannot move. And therefore, 
if we want to be happy, we should allow ourselves some space around and also space inside. The refreshing moon of the Buddha is traveling in the sky of utmost emptiness. The Buddha has a lot of space inside and outside. And therefore, he can be happy. And those of us who have more space inside and around us are happier than other people. And therefore, this practice is to bring space into you and around you. If you want your beloved one to be happy, give her some space around and inside her. If you want to be happy, give yourself some space inside and around. When you arrange flowers, you should know that each flower needs some space around. One flower like this would need this much space at least for the flower to radiate its beauty and its freshness. So next time when you arrange flowers, don't use too many flowers. You need only two or three, and you give each flower a lot of space. Human beings are like flowers. They are flowers, and they should be allowed space inside and outside in order to be happy. So practicing like this is to allow us space inside, space outside. And space here, you cannot rent. On my way here, I saw a sign on by the street, space for rent. <laughs> this space can only be obtained by the practice. You practice in order to offer freedom, to offer emptiness to yourself and to others. If you have so many projects, if you are directors of so many companies, you don't have space, how can you be happy? So throw away most of these things in order to have space inside you and around you. I would like to tell the young people that the Buddha is not a god. He is a human being like us. And the word Buddha means the person who is awake. Bud, the Sanskrit verb, means to wake up. And Buddha means the one who is awake. And if we practice awakening, we become a Buddha. When you practice breathing in and out, your body and your mind become together, become one, and you are there in the present moment. You are very much a Buddha. Only a Buddha, a full Buddha, is someone who is awake all day. But we become awake only from time to time. That is why we should practice mindful breathing in order to be more awake in our daily life. I talk about awareness. I talk about enlightenment, because enlightenment and awareness, they are of the same substance. And now we have the word mindfulness, which is the same, because when you are mindful of what is going on, you are aware and you are enlightened. Suppose I practice breathing in, I'm aware that I have good eyes, Breathing out, I smile to my eyes. That is awareness. That is mindfulness of having good eyes. But that is also enlightenment. Because if I have good eyes, but if I don't know it, I am not enlightened at all. So being enlightened means the same thing as being mindful. And you can get enlightened every minute if you have that kind of awareness. So many of us spend our days in forgetfulness. We live and yet we don't. We get lost in the past. We worry so much about the future, we are afraid of it. We make so many projects, 
we are excited about the future. We have no capacity of being alive in the present moment where everything is. And people who live like that live in forgetfulness. And life is not available to them. And they live like a person who carry their dead body on the shoulder and wanders around. He is already dead. She is already dead. So the problem is to wake up, to be alive again, to resurrect ourselves. And the techniques of resurrection is to go back to your breath and breathing in, I am alive. Breathing out, I smile to myself. This looks simple, but this is the most important practice because many of us do not know how miraculous to be alive in this present moment. And we lose the pure land we lose the kingdom of God. I have spoken of uh, the present moment. It looks as if I advise people not to uh, look back at the past and look forward to the future. If you do not look back at the past, how can you learn from the past? If you do not plan for the future, how can we arrange for our children and grandchildren? But the teaching is like this. The present moment is made of the past. The past is still alive in the present moment. If you are aware, if you are awake, if you are mindful, if you are able to touch the present moment, you also touch the past. Because of the very fact that the present is made of the past. So there is a possibility to change the past. Usually we don't think that we can go back to the past in order to fix things there. We have made some mistake in the past. We have broken something in the past, and now we regret, and we live with our complex of guilt. And many people do not have peace because their guilt is so intense. But if they learn and find out that the past is still there in the present moment, they will know a way out. Because if they breathe in and out and become mindful, when they touch the present, they touch the past. And they can change the past by changing the present. Suppose you said something not very nice to your grandma 20 years ago, and now you regret it. What can you do in order to get rid of your guilt? to be kind to grandma again. Look at the present moment deeply. Look at yourself, and you know that grandma is still alive in you. You are only a continuation of grandma. So look deeply in you and see grandma smiling to you, in yourself. And with that mindfulness, you just say, I'm sorry, grandma. And then you see her smiling to you, and the wound will be healed very quickly. There's no need to live with your anguish, your guilt. Guilt is an obstacle for the practice. And as you can touch the past through the present, why don't do the healing right now? When you are firmly grounded in the present moment, you can look back at the past. You are looking at the present so deeply that you see all the elements that have made up the present moment, and these can be described as the past. Also, you learn that the future will be made of the present moment. 
the present moment is the substance with which the future is made. And therefore, the best way to take care of the future is to take care of the present moment. What else can you do? If you take good care of the present moment, there is no reason why you have to worry about the future, because we know that the future will be made by the present. And that is why hope is sometimes an obstacle. People tend to hope because they feel helpless in the present moment. They find that the present moment is so heavy, so unbearable, difficult to endure. That is why they invest in the future with hope. I hope tomorrow it will be better. I hope after tomorrow things will be better. And they get a little bit relieved because of investing in the future. That is why religions speak a lot about the future, about hope. But in the light of this practice, hope can be an obstacle. Because investing in the future, you have to spend a lot of energy for hoping. And there's not much energy left in order for you to take care of the present. And without enough energy, we cannot have a breakthrough. And therefore, not to hope. Bring all source of your energy back to the present moment and get a breakthrough. And this is uh, the practice. To be awake is to be aware of what is going on in your body, in your feelings, in your perceptions, in your mental formations, and in the world around. You are aware that the trees are beautiful. That is awareness. You are aware that many trees are being cut down. That is awareness. Awareness of what is happening on the good side and on the side that is not so good. To be aware of things in the good side in order to get in touch with them, to, to be nourished by them, to be in touch with what is not good in order to change them, to help stop them and to transform them. And therefore, practicing Awareness, we profit from the practice. And today I would like to speak on the first sign, the sign of what is not wrong, to get in touch with that side. This morning, when I walk from the building to the meditation hall, I got in touch with the sunshine, the beautiful trees, and I made the peaceful steps on the earth. I felt very happy. I felt nourished by the beautiful uh, sky, uh, the sunshine, the beautiful trees. When I touched the earth, I knew that the earth, our mother, is still there. And uh, I got nourished by the fact that I am alive and walking on the earth. So uh, I planted in myself a number of seeds of happiness. I know that uh, this is very important because if I do not have enough happiness within myself, I shall not be able to help other people, other living beings. So that is why every day to practice in order to water the seed of your happiness, of your joy, is very important. Everyone can practice being mindful of the existence of their eyes, of the fact that they are alive. And that seed in their consciousness is called the seed of mindfulness. But because we live in forgetfulness, that is why the seed of mindfulness has been buried deeply in our consciousness for a long time. Now practicing is to water the seed of mindfulness in us so that it will become important 
and manifest more often in our being. Our consciousness is something like this with uh, a lower part and an upper part. The lower part we call a uh, store, and the upper part is called a uh, mind, mind consciousness. Store consciousness, alaya vishnana, contain all seeds, seeds of happiness, seeds of joy, seeds of enlightenment, seeds of anger, seeds of fear, all kinds of seeds, good and bad. And when one seed is water, that seed can grow more strongly and it will manifest itself in the upper level of our consciousness, we call the level of mind consciousness, mano vishnana. Suppose this is a seed of my anger, and if someone water it by saying something mean to, to us, this seed will move, become important, and manifest itself as anger. And it's not pleasant to have the seed of anger manifested in ourselves like that. And because every day we water the seed of unhappiness of each other, that is why these seeds go very strong and they suppress the seeds of happiness within us. The seeds of joy, the seed of peace, the seed of smiling, and so on. And including the seed of mindfulness, which is a wonderful seed. Now the practice is to refrain from watering the seeds of unhappiness and concentrate on watering the seeds of happiness, the seeds of joy, the seeds of peace, the seeds of mindfulness. This seed of mindfulness, which is buried under many layers of uh, afflictions, now begin to be watered by our practice of walking. In, out, fresh, flower fresh, uh, eating mindfully, smiling at a piece of string bean. These are all practice of watering the seed of mindfulness. So the seed of mindfulness will spring up first like that. But if you practice for two days or three days, it becomes bigger and it becomes bigger on the level of the mind consciousness. So for a person who is so unhappy, who live like a dead man, the seed of mindfulness is still in him. And if he knows how to water the seed of mindfulness, he could become an enlightened person and be very happy. So mindfulness may be in us small, but if you know how to practice it, that will become the yeast of your life. And practicing mindfulness in daily life is to stop wanting forgetfulness. And when you stop forgetfulness, many good things will come up. And that is why the first aim of the practice is to stop forgetfulness. And stop forgetfulness not by fighting, but just lighting up mindfulness. When you light up mindfulness, forgetfulness will be transformed. You don't have to chase it away. It's like when you bring in a lamp and then darkness will just dissipate it. So that practice is called samatha. The Chinese word is uh, qi, stopping. Stopping, calming it. There are many things that go wrong in the world and in our own consciousness, in the collective consciousness. And if we learn the art of stopping, we can save ourselves 
save the world and save our children, save our planet. And there are so many ways of practice of stopping in the Buddhist tradition. And breathing in and out is one of the ways of doing that. When you breathe in mindfully, when you breathe out mindfully, you stop forgetfulness and you begin to be alive. Stopping something is to reveal something else. Always like that. Stopping is not a negative thing. Stopping can be a very positive thing because when you stop that darkness, you bring about light. And mindfulness is the kind of uh, energy that you use in order to, to do the work of stopping. When you have uh, some anger in yourself, you bring mindfulness up in order to take care of your anger. And mindfulness becomes mindfulness of anger. Breathing in, I know that I am angry. Breathing out, I know that anger is in me now. You are taking good care of the guest in your living room. Because uh, mind consciousness is the living room, and the store consciousness is your um, basement, where you keep many things. And when something unpleasant appears in the living room, it's like a baby crying in the living room, mother has to come and take care of the baby, holding the baby in her hands, in her arms, with loving kindness. Mindfulness is the mummy. When the baby of anger is crying a lot, kicking a lot, Mother mindfulness has to come up and hold the baby in her arm because she is tenderness, she is love, she is care herself. That is why one minute or two minutes later, the baby stops crying and kicking. Mindfulness has the power of calming and stopping. If you continue to breathe in and out mindfully, and embracing your anger in it, you will transform your anger. When the mommy holds the baby in her arms, her power of love and care will calm the baby. But that's not the only thing the mommy does. Mommy is looking more deeply to find out why the baby is crying. And she may find out that the baby has uh, some uh, temperature, or the baby may have some trouble in its stomach, things like that. And that is the work of looking deeply to see the real causes of the pain. And that is the other aspect of meditation, vipassana. Vipassana means looking deeply. If you do not have enough calm, you cannot hope to have insight. So those who practice insight meditation should practice calming meditation, samatha. Because the moment when you become still like still water and solid like a mountain, you begin to see things much more clearly. And that is why samatha contains vipassana. The same thing is true with uh, Vipassana. When you are able to see into the true nature of things, you already have calm and stillness within yourself. Therefore, in Vipassana, you already have Samatha. And both practice calming, and looking deeply is carried out 
by a kind of energy you call mindfulness. Mindfulness is the blood of your psyche. You have some mindfulness within you, but that mindfulness is still weak and is not enough. It has not enough power to heal, to calm, and to transform. That is why we need to practice in order for mindfulness to become a habit energy. Vasana, the kind of energy that will be helpful. We have so many kinds of habit energies that are destructive. But here is a kind of habit energy that is the rescuing power and healing power, the power of mindfulness. And this is the practice of getting in touch with what is refreshing and healing. As I have said, Samatha meditation the meditation of calming and stopping has already possessed insight in it. Because once you become calm, the moon of the truth begins to reflect in yourself. And that is why when you use your mindfulness in order to touch an issue, to touch the full moon, to touch the sunset, to touch the flower, to touch your old child, then these kind of things will reveal more deeply to yourself. And when you use mindfulness in order to touch your pain, your anger, mindfulness begins to transform it with or without your intention to do so. It is like the sunshine. In the morning, the flower is not open yet. But if the sun continues to shine on the flower, and the energy of the sunshine penetrates little by little into the flower, and then one, two, three hours later, the flower will open. Energy entering into another zone of energy will bring about some transformation. So the fact that you breathe mindfully on your anger can already help. Mindfulness is there to take care of our pain. And even before it does anything, it has the effect of calming and stopping already. And therefore, bringing mindfulness as an energy to encompass your pain, your anger, is what we do in meditation. What we do in meditation, whether walking or sitting or lying. Some of you may say that this is a form of suppressing our anger. No, it's not. The mother does not put a hand over the mouth of her baby, no? The mother does not do the spanking uh, job. The mother just takes good care of the baby, and we take good care of our anger in the most non-violent, most tender way possible. So it cannot be described as an act of suppression. It should be described as an act of taking care. Mindfulness is the best part of us. It is the big brother, it is the big sister, it is the Buddha, the mother, that will come out to the living room and take very good care of the baby anger, the baby pain. And this is having direct contact, touching your anger, touching your pain. Because in psychotherapy, they talk about getting in touch with anger, but they don't say exactly what is getting in touch with anger. In Buddhist psychology, it is stated very clearly that the 
agent that gets in touch with anger is mindfulness. And the encounter between the two is like the encounter between mother and baby will provoke a change. And when the situation is not so difficult anymore because of the work of embracing the baby, the mother will be able to see deeply into the baby in order to see what is wrong with the baby. So mindfulness, after having performed the work of calming, will be used to perform the work of looking deeply, and that is vipassana, inside meditation. And that is what I describe to be the massage of mindfulness, having the blood to touch the painful zone. Suppose someone is angry with his father. He cannot stand sitting with his father. He believes that his father is the cause of all his misery. Now, if we offer the young man therapy, we suggest that he practice this, breathing in, I see myself as a five-year-old child. Breathing out, I smile to that five-year-old child that is me. And that is the practice of visualizing yourself as a five-year-old person. In order for you to see that as a five-year-old child, you are very vulnerable. You can be hurt very easily by anyone at any moment. A stern look from your father can wound you. A shout from your mother can hurt you deeply. And when father and mother are having a fight, well, you got all the suffering into your store consciousness. We have to know that even we are born, our store consciousness already began to receive wounds from our mother and father. Everything she eat, everything she drink, everything she worry about, every suffering that she has in herself penetrate in our store consciousness. So she, who is an expecting mother, should know that in order to practice mindfulness of eating and of taking care of her emotions for herself, for her baby. And her husband has to practice mindfulness also in order not to brutalize her, not to say things, not to do things in order to hurt her store consciousness and at the same time the store consciousness of his child. So that is the practice of mindfulness in the context of the family, taught to be for the sake of the child, but it is really for the sake of the whole family. How could a mother not practice mindfulness if she cares about the well-being of her child? She has to eat properly, drink properly, to live her emotional life in such a way that it will not hurt the baby inside her. And the father has to be aware of that and help his wife doing so for the protection of his baby. When the child is born, although the baby does not know the language of adults, but a fight between father and mother a hurting statement made by either the father and mother, the child receive it. Because the vibration in the speech can go directly to the child. We continue to plant and to sow seeds of suffering in the store consciousness of our baby. We think that the baby is too small, how could he understand? But that's not true. The heavy atmosphere in the family continue to water the seed of unhappiness in a child. In Buddhism, 
store consciousness is very often compared to a piece of fertile soil, the land of the mind, the mind field. And as parents, we are responsible for the planting of uh, earlier seeds within that uh, fertile field. Very important. And you know that if you are not mindful, and then you can make your child unhappy by continuously sowing this kind of seed in him. From time to time, the little boy, in order to avoid uh, suffering, run into the toilet room and lock himself in there. It is a tragedy, but his parents do not notice it. And he suffers silently, very deeply, inside the toilet room. And with that kind of heritage, he grew up as an unhappy person, and a young lady he married will have to suffer and the children that they bore will continue to suffer because the young boy now has become adult and does not know how to transform the seeds of suffering in his store consciousness, naturally make his children suffer, his wife suffer. That is the will of samsara. So I propose that those who are about to get married should engage in half a year of practice in order to transform their internal formations here first before they get married. That's for their sake and the sake of their children. One year may be good. In countries like Thailand, uh, Cambodia, the, all young men are expected to practice something like a year in the monastery. Maybe in America you can do that. And that would be a requirement for those who want to, to marry, to get married. <laughs> One year of practice in order to transform the seed of suffering transmitted by parents. Otherwise, you will perpetuate the cycle of suffering on and on. So when a young man practice looking at himself as a five-year-old child and smile to that vulnerable, fragile five-year-old child, suddenly some understanding is born. Because of that vulnerability, fragility, he gets hurt so easily. So the smile directed to him is a smile of compassion. I am having compassion vis-a-vis -vis myself as a five-year-old child. Poor me, I was helpless. I did not know how to deal with that. When seeds of suffering are sown and watered in myself. After that, the young man was offer another meditation. Breathing in, I see my father as a five-year-old child. Breathing out, I smile to that five-year-old child that was my father. It may be the first time he can visualize his father as a five-year-old child. Before that, the father was only a very grim, difficult person. The moment when you can see your father as a five-year-old child, you get an insight. You may need uh, the family album. You may need uh, imagination, but you have to visualize your father as a five-year-old child. And when you are capable of seeing him like that, you see that there is no difference between him, five-year-old, and you, five-year-old, also very, very vulnerable, very, very fragile, and easily getting hurt. If you grow up like that, you cannot help but making other people suffer. So the young man sees his father as a five-year-old child, and some insight is born. 
he smiled to that five-year-old child with compassion. And this is the first uh, wave of blood he sent into his painful zone. But not enough. He has to do it again and again, breathing in, breathing out, in order to bring the blood of mindfulness into the zone of pain and to encompass the father, poor daddy. He was like me. He suffered so during his childhood. He is worth my compassion. He needs my compassion rather than my anger. That is uh, the equivalent of looking deeply, doing the work of massaging. That is the job of vipassana meditation, insight. And how can you do that if you do not have some amount of calm, of stability, of stillness, of freedom? If you are not free, and then how can you have the time and the energy to do it? Get free from your worries, from your being busy, from your boredom, from your forgetfulness. Become free and you have the energy and the time in order to practice looking, looking deeply. Mi mắt chân trời mỏi This concludes part one of The Art of Mindful Living with Thich Nhat Hanh. We continue with part two.